A very good evening to all of you. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to a fireside chat with Kinder Global Law School alumnus, Mr. Kabir Darshan Singh Chaudhary, and National Law University Orissa alumnus, Mr. Kushagra Sinha, on the topic of the changing landscape of intermediary guidelines in India. I'm Professor Shireen Moti, Assistant Professor of Law and Director of Alumni Relations at OP Jindal Global University. OP Jindal Global University was started in the year 2009 under the visionary leadership of our Chancellor, Mr. Naveen Jindal, and our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar. In the span of a decade, OP Jindal Global University has been recognized as an institute of eminence by the government of India, and Jindal Global Law School has been recognized as a number one law school in India by QSP ranking. Before I invite our esteemed panelists for today, I would like to introduce them briefly. Mr. Kushagra Sinha graduated with a BLLB Honours degree from National Law University of Orissa in the year 2015. He has the experience of practicing before district courts, the Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court of India on varied matters. He has worked as an in-house counsel with Ola Cabs. Currently, he is working as a technology lawyer in New Delhi. In addition, he also works with the Software Freedom Law Center India as a volunteer counsel. Mr. Kabir Darshan Singh Chaudhary graduated with a BLLB Honours degree from Jindal Global Law School in the year 2014. He successfully completed the LAMP Fellowship Program and has the experience of working as an associate member at Nishad Desai Associates. He has also worked as a law clerk at Software Freedom Law Center at New York. He graduated with an LLM in Law, Science and Technology from Stanford Law School in 2018. He's a technology attorney based in New York. We are privileged to have both of us, uh, both of them here today with us discussing a very important and uh, pertinent topic, especially in these times of uh, unprecedented times, which is the changing landscape of intermediary guidelines. Uh, welcome Kushagra and Kabir. We are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you to be here. Sorry about that. Hi. Good morning. Hi, guys. Uh, good uh, evening. Sorry. Yes. So, Kabir is joining us from New York. So, it's still morning for him. Uh, welcome to both of you, and we're delighted, certainly delighted to have you with us today. Um, before we dive into the topic for today, which is the changing landscape of intermediary guidelines in India, it would be interesting to know a little bit more about your educational journeys and experiences. Both of you have had really interesting journeys, your similar backgrounds, and then you have dwelled into this field of technology law. So to both of you, starting with Kabir, uh, how and when did you decide that you would like to become a lawyer? Um. Hi, right, thanks. Yeah. It's good to see you. Uh, I I did not particularly have it in my mind why I would do it, but uh, I was really inspired after reading the book Discovery of India by Nehru. Not the right name to take uh, in the current circumstances. Uh, so that's why he was a barrister, and I thought I'd become a lawyer too because that's somewhere we could just. Uh, it means to like uh, you, you could be associated with delivering the justice in some way or getting someone the access to justice while making decent amount of uh, means to live your life as well so that's why i just become a lawyer that's an interesting um, inception of the idea of studying law and then becoming a lawyer what about you kushagra what made you uh, decide that this is it this is what you want to do and this is what you want to for five long years and then gradually build a career around it. Hi, Shireen. It was uh, quite early in life that I finalized that I wanted to be a lawyer. It was a mix of uh, uh, a little inspiration that I received from a few lawyers who had who I had in the family. And I felt that it was a good match for my skills. So somewhere around early teens, I like decided this is what I wanted to do. OK, so you began very early. So probably you had the time to think and uh, you know reflect on your choices but some of us uh, did start in our late teens when it came to uh, studying law uh, both of you have studied from these premier institutes of law in india and have had the privilege of getting a good legal education starting with you kushagra how were those five long years in national law university are there any, any memories uh, outside inside classroom and what do you think made you shape into this uh, remarkable lawyer that you are today well, uh, the interesting thing about law schools and the way uh, they teach law in this country is by the time you realize what you're doing, sometimes it's already too late. 
but uh, nevertheless it's always very important to keep doing something so personally i was never uh, very like very involved in academics but i was into a lot of moots we went for a lot of moots a lot of debates i traveled a lot try to read read as much as i could uh, and i i didn't even realize when those five wonderful years went by but you realize now that those were the wonderful years isn't it in what hindsight i do yeah i mean that's interesting to know that uh, though you weren't too academically driven when it came to uh, inside classroom learning you did take uh, up the opportunities that were given to you outside the classroom what about you kabir how were those five years at jindal global law school for you oh yeah that was definitely an interesting time uh, the fact that uh, i studied with you and now you're a professor at the law school so uh, we've come a long way uh, i i i i mean this is something whenever i talk about this law school i always mention it that uh, this this law school just gave me an opportunity uh, to develop a skill to have a perspective about different issues in uh, about uh, in in law and because uh, like to be bluntly I, if i have to mention it bluntly i think anyone can become a lawyer but what differentiates you is your ability to have a perspective about uh, a particular issue uh from very different point of views which i think this law school gave me uh so yeah it it was an interesting time uh, being there i wasn't one of the brightest students but uh, whatever said whatever said and done i managed i'm sure uh, you did uh, better than what you say because i was right there and those were really wonderful years uh, learning and uh, developing your skill set and very uh, well put that you know what differentiates one lawyer from the other the skill set as well as the perspective the idea the analytical ability to look at a problem from all angles and then attack it according to your uh, the side that you are representing uh, that is uh, quite uh, helpful uh, kushagra so you are uh, ex you have developed an expertise on, in technology law and that is something that was still booming uh, during the time uh, when we were at law school and it's still an evolving space Uh, so, how did you stumble upon this area of law, and then what did you do to? What were some of the steps that you that you took to develop your interest further in technology law? So, back in law school, uh, as you know, not a lot of law schools were teaching technology law, but they should have uh, back then, and now also a lot of them should include it. So, we weren't taught uh, technology law or the IT Act in. It wasn't part of our curriculum. but uh, my interest with information technology law started uh, with a couple of my internships where i got to do these uh, these projects or these assignments which had a lot to do with the it act there was the data protection bill that was out there back then so i got to do some research on that it started with that but majorly i think it started when i uh, when i began working with ola is is when i started doing some serious work on technology law on on law relating to emerging te technologies and startups and also after uh, finishing my uh, stint at ola when i was advising a few startups when i was doing litigation in delhi also and a few technology matters before courts so then i realized that this is something we can actually do and now that i've started working with sflc it's it's uh, all that i'm doing full time technology law litigation as well as policy work so yeah it's a good mix and law and policy is something that overlaps all the time and now another uh, expertise within the expertise of technology law if you have an idea of both of those things and i personally feel that if you have a good understanding of the law uh, you have those skills to analyze the policy as well and you can't uh, divorce one from the other uh, so kabir coming back to you uh, you did your llm uh, from stanford law school which is like a premier institute uh, in the world um, you also developed an expertise in technology law so there's a dual question here firstly why uh, did you choose to go to stanford was it something that you always wanted to do and uh, how did you go about developing your skill set in the area of technology law so yeah i i i think my interest in technology law started at a pretty early age it was third year of the law school and i was in a pretty uh, activist mode of my uh, while we were at the law school Uh, at that point of time, the government of India had come up with the intermediary guidelines, which we are going to talk about today. And that was the first time I carried out uh, uh, 
a petition, uh, a nationwide petition collecting about one and a half lakh signatures to send it to the Minister of Information Technology, then Mr. Kapil Sibyl, to say as to how this was violating the freedom of speech and expression of Indians. Uh, so that's how I got inspired and there was no looking back. And after that, I had a chance to read about a couple of professors uh, who, who like whose work was really inspiring, I think, way ahead of our times. Uh, the fact that I worked uh, with a member of parliament, I had first-hand exposure of uh, how the Indian parliament works. And uh, to some extent, I felt that the, the technology gap, which is there in Indian legislature, which needs to be addressed. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to work with the technology media telecommunications team uh, at Nishit Desai Associates and to work with some of the clients at Silicon Valley. So I think the deal was sealed then. It's not that I thought I'd be able to come here, but uh, I don't know whether the, what was going on in the admission committee's mind to let me have an opportunity to come to Palo Alto and study with them. So yeah, it happened. That's why I came to Stanford. Yeah. Yes, who would uh, let go of that opportunity? It's uh, one of the most uh, remarkable institutions uh, in the world, and I'm sure that has shaped you as a lawyer for times to come. Uh, so both of you have had this outstanding journey so far, and I'm sure that there's a long way to go and there's so many other things to achieve. But there, uh, there's certainly something that you have in your mind when it comes to your professional journey. So first Kushagrin, then Kabir, what are you looking forward to? to in your professional journey going forward? I'm not sure. I just, I'm just in a happy space right now. And I think for the next few years, at least I'll continue to do the work that I'm doing, which is a mix of uh, litigation and policy work, work that really impacts uh, the debate and discussion around rights in the country. And with so much that's happening, if you can contribute even in a little way, uh that that's that gives me a lot of satisfaction so that's what i uh, look forward to doing for the next few years okay that that's a, a good goal that's a practical goal and also has societal implications uh and happiness is uh, something which is paramount uh what about you kabir so Shireena, I'm, I'm on a sabbatical right now so i'm not sure where i'm heading with my career I like what I do right now, what I've been doing right now. But then again, I didn't say no to different things. So tomorrow, if I have to maybe like uh, start my own venture or maybe start a YouTube channel, I'd love to do that. But as of now, I'm on a sabbatical and just uh, enjoying the quarantine. That's, that's good. Uh, most of us are doing that. And I guess uh, it's a good break for you to actually not a break, but a good way to be insightful and uh, make uh, your choices consciously going forward. So that's nice to hear. Uh, now let's move on quickly dive into the topic for today. So as we know, we are going to discuss the changing landscape of intermediate intermediary guidelines. And in that also comes the fact that we're going to specifically talk talk about uh, that in December 2018, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology released the draft intermediary guidelines, uh, which has a lot of implications uh, on the rights of individuals, uh, which is broadly what the topic for today is. But when we discuss intermediary guidelines broadly, we are also talking about the liability aspect of it. So uh, the way we are going to do this is that I'm going to ask you a a few set of questions and invite your comments on each of those. Also, a word to the attendees that towards the end of today's session, we will be taking the questions that you may have. So uh, please uh, keep sending your questions and we will collate them towards the end of uh, the question Q&A that we are having right now. And Sabir and Kushagra will be happy to answer those questions. So beginning with the first basic question for uh, the uninitiated uh, who do not know uh, what these intermediate guidelines are, what is intermediary liability? Coming to you, Kabir, first, could you give a broad overview of what is intermediary liability and how it came about in the United States? Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? We can hear you now. Okay, yes. so uh, I'll try to explain it uh, in the most rudimentary terms as possible. Let's not just stick to the, like what the term is, intermediary liability. 
So uh, the origins of it lies in a common law principle that uh, if you're distributing someone else's content, uh, you can only be held liable for it if you're aware or you have the knowledge of the legality of that particular content. Either that or that as a disseminator, you exercise certain set of editorial controls over it. So as to whether it should be published, whether you can edit it. And this is something which is applied to the traditional set of publishers as we know it, the newspapers, uh, the magazines, the common carriers. Now the situation really changes when we're talking about the intermediaries online. And at this juncture, I wanna mention what intermediaries are. Um, without going into the definition, which is mentioned in the Information Technology Act in India, uh, the most basic thing is intermediary is an ent entity which provides certain services that enables you to access internet. Now it can include anything uh, like uh, like an uh, information service provider, a network service provider, sorry, internet service provider, network service provider, a search engine, a social network, a mobile app, like all these are something which are uh, helping you access the internet. So these are all intermediaries. Now the issue arises is, <coughs> sorry, uh, when we are having a certain criteria for the liability of the common carriers, the offline ones, uh, like uh, newspapers and uh, magazines, why can't the same criteria be applied to these online intermediaries? Now, prima facie, you would understand it, like just in the face of it, that uh, online intermediaries are very different from the online uh, offline intermediaries. You don't have a lot of human presence to, um, like pre-screen the data there. And there is some sort of data uh, which just cannot be pre-screened. For example, as we're talking on this webinar and if it was being hosted on, on a particular website live, and then I start talking about a hypothetical leader of a country who lies about his degrees or stuff like that, and someone may consider it defam defamation. Uh, but that is something which uh, the, the, the intermediary here could not preempt or pre-screen. So that is why the same, uh, and sorry, one thing I forgot to mention, the amount of data which is being uh, uploaded on these online intermediaries, it's running into zettabytes. So humanly, it's not possible to pre-screen it at all. So that's why the debate comes in that we need to have a different set of criteria uh, for these online intermediaries. Now, this broadly sets out what intermediary liability is, like how we are supposed to set out their liability. Now, intermediary liability for the first time came up in the United States in as early as 90s. Uh, so at that point of time, there was no particular legislation about it and internet was relatively a new thing. So before the New York Federal Court, there was a case, it was called Cubby versus Computer, uh, CompuServe, where this was the traditional dial-up connection which used to be provided and CompuServe used to provide certain content resources and databases for its users to browse upon. And what used to happen was that the third parties would upload their newsletters or content there and people could browse on it and per minute they were charged and a part of that fee was given as a license fee to these newsletter owners. So there was one particular third party newsletter, it was called Romoville, uh, which provided certain set of contact uh, content uh, which the users of CompuServe could access. Naturally, going by the name itself, uh, there was a defamation suit against Romoville and CompuServe because uh, it says rumors, so that's what uh, used to be uploaded there. And the court here dismissed uh, uh, dismissed the case, stating that CompuServe, which is there, it cannot be treated as a publisher. It was merely a distributor of the content, right? And it could only be held liable if it knew or had the reason to know of the defamatory content. So what happened was this gave away to something called the notice and takedown approach, which I think Kushagra will talk to you later about because that's prevalent in India. Uh, what it meant was that uh, aggrieved individuals now had to just provide a notice to these uh, service providers like CompuServe and then could get the uh, whatever the like uh, contentious content used to be the taken down. After that, there's another case which came up. These are the two landmark cases which set up the intermediary liability for the entire world and how we know, how the internet, how we know it right now. It was Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy. And Stratton Oakmont is the same investment banker which we have all seen Leonardo DiCaprio heading in the movie Wolf of the Wall Street. 
So Prodigy was another service provider, and there was some defamatory content about Straton Oakmont, which was uploaded on its uh, bulletin board. It used to host a bulletin board online on the internet. Now, in this case, surprisingly, what happened was the court held Prodigy to be liable. The court said that uh, here, since as per the terms and policy, the Prodigy reserved the rights to edit and take down the objectionable content. It was exposed to the liability like a publisher. So now what these two cases le led to was a phenomena like it, it, it led to something called, uh, it's called the moderator's dilemma. So as a moderator, like someone who's providing the facility, if I do not touch the content at all, if I don't take the right to edit it completely, I will have no liability, I'll just be a dispute. If I moderate it, then I'll open myself to the liability. So it was a dilemma for the service provider that whether should I moderate it or whether should I not moderate it. And the people erred on the side of not moderating it. And that was going fine at that point of time until the internet started, people started getting access to the internet at large. Now, at that point of time, the United States Congress had a had a concern that they didn't want child pornography to, to be spread around or child, children to have access to pornography. How did they want to address it? They wanted to overturn the Stratton Oakmont judgment and they wanted to incentivize these platforms to moderate, but they could not sanction it completely. Like they did not want to mandate it because the free speech laws in, in the United States are pretty strong. So what they did was they came up with what is called Section 230 of Communications Decency Act, and it has two provisions. And famously, famously it's known that these are the 26 letters which form the internet as we know it today. So the first, uh, the clause one, what it says is that no provider or user of interactive computer service, and it includes everything as I mentioned before, can be treated as a publisher or a speaker of third party content. So what it essentially did was that it provided like a shield which an America, which Captain America has. That if I am a service provider and any content which is being uploaded right now, I will not be treated as a speaker or a publisher of it. What will happen? And here it, like the point about you having a knowledge of the illegality of the content was also dismissed. So even if I had knowledge that, okay, this content is illegal and if I let it stay, I would still not be held liable for it. Like that's the overbroad protection which United States law provided. But at the same time, what Congress wanted to do was Congress wanted these guys to take down the pornographic content or the child pornographic content, stuff like that. So they came up with the second provision which said that, okay, if these providers in good faith would moderate the content and take down some content which they felt was uh, lewd, obscene in good faith, they will stay, they will still not be held liable. Like they could not be considered publishers as was decided in the case of Stratton Oakmont. And this, like this was what all the platforms could ask for. Like this is the best scenario which you could get. Here, there were like really minute carve outs for it. One was for the inter intellectual property laws, which is the outside the scope of this discussion, but that is also covered under the intermediary law regime under Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the other exception to it is the federal criminal laws, but rarely there has been any incidents of uh, Department of Justice of the United States taking actions against these uh, uh, big platforms for the third party content. There have been settlements, but there hasn't been any action. So what this entire framework did was that uh, it encouraged innovation by avoiding liability. And the other is it encouraged moderation also. So I'll give you an example. Uh, today, if I come with a defamatory article uh, and I give it to you and you are a publisher of a newspaper and you publish it in a newspaper, then someone, then you could attract liability as the author as well because you're a publisher of that newspaper. But in the second scenario, if I come to you and I say, I come up with the same article and you are a publisher of the newspaper, instead of printing it with the hard copy of the newspaper, you just put it online on the website of your newspaper then under section 230 you will not get any liability you are completely protected so not only were you getting the legal privileges you were also these were also turning out to be in the financial privileges that there were no pre-publication costs of reviewing the content there was no post-publication cost there was no scare of uh, any there was no expenditure to be in, incurred in terms of hiring lawyers about the legality of the content so today whatever platforms we know google facebook 
all of these teams because they had such a beautiful regime running for them. Yes, as of now, there are some carve outs and there are some exceptions and some amendments being discussed, which I'll go over later. But this, I think, uh, lays down the broad way how the intermediary liability came up in the United States and how it influenced the rest of the world. That's so interesting. And uh, what I would like to say is that you have given us a broad overview of how intermediary liability has evolved over the years in the US, implications on the freedom of speech and expression, and also uh, interesting to understand uh, the way in which the uh, three branches of the government, executive, legislative, and judiciary worked uh, uh, in respect of developing these uh, intermediary liability guidelines or intermediate uh, the framework of intermediary liability in the US and uh, certainly it has so many implications and so many loopholes have been addressed over the years uh, as you said if you publish online uh, that might not attract liability but if you publish in hard copy that attracts liability so that is something which, which is very interesting to know uh, also the US has been a source of uh, emulation for other countries when it comes to law and uh, especially when you said uh, that uh, this was something which has been taking place from early 1990s that is something that was uh, really interesting uh, coming to you kushagra even back home in india uh, we have a lot of uh, debate regarding intermediary liability uh, could you throw some light on this debate and uh, some of the early discussions around this topic so uh, as Kabir has beautifully illustrated what it means, uh, in layman terms, intermediary liability means the responsibility of the intermediaries in relation to the content which is hosted upon their platform. Now, in the Indian context, uh, what is an intermediary? So section two of the Information Technology Act defines an intermediary as any person who receives, stores, or transmits an electronic record or provides a service with respect to that record on behalf of another person. So this definition, uh, a critique of this definition is also that it's way too broad. But uh, generally speaking, this definition would include everyone from a cyber cafe to an internet service provider to social media platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and OTT platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, all of them. So this is uh, the debate around intermediary liability in India is so important because if it affects the way we communicate with each other on the online space. And thanks to the coronavirus pandemic situation, that's the only uh, communication that's that's left, uh, which is happening these days. So it's also related to the issues of safety and security on the internet. Uh, what kind of content is being circulated on the internet and uh, what kind of impact it can have on us and on children as well. So uh, the intermediary liability debate started in India in uh, 2004 uh, with the Avnish Bajaj case. Now, what happened in this case was that an obscene MMS was listed for sale on the e-commerce website called Bazi.com. Uh, subsequently, the owner of this case, Mr. Avnish, but uh, owner of uh, Bazi.com was implicated in this case and a charge sheet was filed against him. Uh, he filed a quashing petition before the Delhi High Court. The Delhi High Court said that a prima facie case was could be made out against him uh, under provision of the IPC and the IT Act. He then appealed, uh, Mr. Avnish Bajaj then appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that vicarious liability could be uh, could not be imposed upon Avnish Bajaj and he could not be held guilty under the, under the IT Act as the company was not an accused in this case. Even after being uh, uh, not being not being convicted in this case, uh, this case and the very fact that an owner of a website who is not aware of the content which is being circulated on the website who be implicated with criminal charges in a case caused a lot of uproar in the country. Now, this development led to uh, the amendment of the IT Act, and as a consequence, uh, Section 79 was amended. And uh, Section 79 Clause 1 said, uh, provided that tech platforms cannot be held liable for the content hosted uh, by them on their platforms. So this was a watershed moment in the intermediary liability scenario in India. And this was this basically built the safe harbor provision uh, in, in the IT Act, which facilitated uh, protection of or shielding of intermediaries from uh, being, being held responsible for the content which is being uh, posted on their platform. Okay, uh, that's amazing uh, to hear. 
and uh, I can see that there's a lot of contrast between uh, Indian and uh, US when it, India and US when it comes to uh, intermediary liability. Are there some points that you would hi would like to highlight, Kabir, and then Kushagru when it comes to a comparison between US and India in terms of the uh, entire gamut of intermediary liability? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, hi. So as Kushag explained the uh, Indian landscape, I'm not going to delve into much of it, but uh, I'll, I'll just tell you how broadly the US uh, regime differs from that of, of India. Uh, one is that, uh, so to contextualize it, we need to understand that US is really personal about it, uh, like really protective of its First Amendment rights, that's the free speech rights. And if, if I have to see, if I have to say, I think it has one of the one of the best and one of the most beautifully developed free speech rights in the world. And uh, to some extent, Section 230 uh, relates to it as well, although that was not the intention. Uh, but over the course of time, what has happened is, and as I explained to you, that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act provides a broad protection of it. And it, it, it's, it's not conditional, like it's, it's a genuine relationship. So you don't have to do anything. You don't need to carry out some due diligence or have certain policies in place or uh, help the government agencies with it uh, in order to avail the safe harbor. Just by the very fact that you are in, uh, like a service provider, you get the protection there. There would be certain carve outs of it, but your protection is given to you and the and like you have no obligation to moderate it, but uh, you are encouraged to moderate it. Whereas in India, uh, as Kushagra would explain further, would be that uh, section 1279 of mm, the Information Technology Act provides for this protection and uh, like the safe harbor protection, but safe harbor protection in India is conditional. It's like the aesthetic, the terms and conditions apply. Uh, so what you have to do is there are a bunch of uh, some the 2011 guidelines which came up the information technology intermediary guidelines 2011. Now they lay down some provisions that uh, prima facie any content which is uploaded, uh, you need to carry out some due diligence and to see that whether it is grossly offensive to someone, uh, and, you know, like obscene, and there are some other categories which I mentioned as well. The other thing which it says is that. Uh, uh, like you need to have a privacy policy in place and you need to help uh, the government uh, agencies in any sort of investigation which has to be carried out. And if you don't comply with any of these, you don't get the safe harbor protection in India. In, in India, So that's the broad, I would say, the difference between the two and if Kushagra wants to add to it. But I think uh, US, US's protection for these intermediaries, intermediaries is really robust. Uh, with some really few exceptions, uh, like as I already mentioned before. And there would one or two, which I talk about later, which is the FOSTA, which recently came up about, but otherwise it's really broad and not sure. conditional. And that uh, really highlights uh, the difference between the US and Indian regime, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, Kushagra, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so in addition to Section 79 of the IT Act, the government also brought out the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines Rules 2011, which basically provides for the procedure to be uh, to be followed when content is to be removed. Now, what is the kind of content which can be removed? This is uh, grossly harmful, obscene, blasphemous, defamatory, disparaging, harmful to minors and unlawful content. Now, the problem with these definitions is that they are not really defined. So if the government says that this is what it is, then you have to acknowledge it and the content has to be removed by the intermediaries. So, so these are the due diligence procedures yeah, which have to be followed by the intermediaries to be accorded uh, this, the safe harbor protection under Section 79. Yes, um, that really adds to the whole debate about the difference between US and India. Uh, having had the background of uh, what uh, the law in the US is and in India is and what the contrast is, let's dwell a little more into uh, the Indian aspect of the intermediary guidelines. So all of us here attending here have heard about the uh, famous Facebook arrest case and that was a huge controversy about 
four or five years back. But it took so long for the government of India to come up with an intermediary guideline. Uh, so what we would like to understand as attendees of this uh, session is that what triggered this amendment of intermediary guidelines by the government of India and why did it take so long for the government of India to react? We know we are in a country wherein all our regulators and institutions are reactive, but uh, certainly some things require proactiveness more than the others. So uh, firstly, why do you think that the government of India took so long to respond to something that was uh, so important? And second, uh, what are your views on the way the government of India has handled this issue so far? Kushagra, to you. So uh, all of this started with uh, the Facebook arrest case that you're referring to. This happened in November 2012. Uh, when two girls were arrested by Thane Rural Police in Maharashtra for criticizing the Band, which followed the death of a big state leader in Maharashtra. Now, in that particular case, uh, after a month, they were arrested for their comments. The state police submitted a closure report on the case, and the final report, which was submitted by the state police before the magistrate's court, said that the allegations against the two girls had been dropped. Now, this had also happened uh, because of the outrage and the sheer uh, intensity of what had happened to those two girls. As a consequence of this, and as a consequence of, of the outrage, uh, Shreya Singhal, who was a law student at that time, filed a PIL before the Supreme Court, challenging the constitutionality of Section 66A of the IT Act, uh, which is the provision under which the two girls had been implicated in that case. Uh, now, Shreya Singhal versus Union of India, very shortly, of course, it held that Section 66A is unconstitutional. But in respect of the intermediary liability debate in India, it uh, stated very specifically uh, and it read down the provision uh, section se uh, 79 of the IT Act and it held that an intermediary would only be obligated to remove content after receiving actual knowledge through a court order or uh, after receiving an order from the government. Now, earlier what was happening was that intermediaries were receiving these at random requests and uh, they had to remove content these requests but the court in this case emphasized upon the point of actual knowledge and then it said that uh, it can only be done if you receive it from a court uh, by an order of the court or by a competent authority of the government so this solidified uh, the intermediary uh, the safe harbor provision and the protection given to intermediary in india now uh, moving on what has happened in uh, the post shreya single scenario after the Shreya single judgment, a lot of things have happened uh, with the development of technology and FEB virtually uh, so many people owning smartphones and operating uh, use of internet has increased. This has also led to instances of uh, mob lynching and mob violence. Uh, in addition to that, so in the case of Tessin Punawala versus Union of India, the Supreme Court advocated the introduction of a law to specifically deal with lynchings. And in addition to that, it also said uh, that the government should take steps to prohibit the dissemination of offensive material through social media platforms or any other means. Now, we are also aware that there has been a rise in child sexual abuse material. Uh, in Also in the Prajwala case, the Supreme Court directed intermediaries to deploy technological tools that would filter obscene con content on the basis of keywords. So the court in its order uh, in uh, December 2018 held that the government of India may frame the necessary guidelines or standard operating procedures and implement them uh, so as to eliminate child pornography, rape and gang rape, uh, gang rape imageries, videos and sites in content hosting platforms and other applications. So these are the social issues and the culmination of these issues which uh, found a place in these case laws which uh, contributed further to the intermediary liability debate in India. That is uh, something which is interesting to know as well as your view in terms of the impact of the, uh, the reaction of the government of India when it came to the Facebook arrest case and then the develop and so on and so forth and especially uh, the fallout in terms of social issues. Also, we are trying to save the uh, save a lot of people uh, over the internet while uh, things are moving really fast on the internet. So I think the regulators and the internet uh, institutions that govern the internet are also trying to 
grapple with the constant changes uh, in society as well as the way humans interact uh, online. So those are interesting things to do and I think the, a benefit of doubt has to be given to the government of India and to governments all across the world because they're dealing with something that is so new and so challenging that keeping pace with the development online is something that is uh, also a challenge in itself. Uh, Kabir, would you like to add something to what Kushagra said? So, uh, I'll, I'll just give a United States perspective to it and uh, I'll take the liberty to share my personal opinion about what's happening in India. Uh, personally, I was, uh, uh, personally, I don't think the conditional safe harbor is one, a good policy. Uh, so the way it started in India, I really didn't like it. But then again, the Supreme Court's judgment was somewhat uh, progressive to at least read down the the intermediary guidelines. Because initially, as Kushagra mentioned, anyone could file a complaint, and the guys were supposed to take a action or to take it down within 36 hours without really providing the other party the recourse to even challenge that order or to say that okay, no, this content is fine. So anyone, it it could cast chilling effects in the free speech. But uh, as Kushagar rightly pointed out that uh, the internet's changing, so that's why uh, like after four years, the government of India is thinking about changing the regulations. Interestingly, the United States came up with the intermediary guideline framework in 1990s. Since then, now they are considering about changing it. And they're not looking at the changes as much as the way India has changed right now. But let's just see why the change is warranted or at least uh, this is like the first time I would say both not the first time, but uh, in a while we're seeing a bipartisan support. against Section 230 of the Communi uh, Communications Decency Act for completely different reasons, but they are both against it right now. But just get the let's just get the context of it as Kushagra mentioned. This came up in 1990s. The Internet was very limited. We were not watching videos in it. There were people not on Tinder or apps like this. Uh, there were no instant messages. People were not reading news there. Like it was pretty limited at that point of time. And things have changed since then, like drastically changed. And now what has happened? We have seen um, the increase of stuff like uh, revenge porn, child pornography, uh, harassment. And one of the big things is fake news, uh, which I mean, the entire debate in the United States, one of the reasons it started was that there is an allegation that Russia ended up influencing the uh, the US election results with the prevalence of fake news on the online platforms. But like, why are we concerned now? So what happened is a good thing what uh, Section 230C uh, did for the entire world because majority of the internet companies end up coming from the United States. Uh, like all the big platforms if we talk about Netflix, uh, Google, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all of them have come from here and they, even though they came from here, they expanded to the rest of the world, but their primary liability lied with the US laws initially. So that's why they were able to become such big platforms. So what they did was they enabled, like I'd say, uh, what's the population of the world, about six to seven billion people of, of the world to interact with each other without any boundaries. That was a good thing which it did. But the bad thing also what it did was that it allowed six to seven billion people and an ability to talk to each other without any territorial borders. Now, naturally, it's bound to have some rogue elements, like the ones who are not going to agree, the ones who are going to engage into these activities of uh, sharing content which we don't agree with. Now, what this has led to is that uh, this has led to sort of a narrative that because section 230 is there these platforms have no uh, in in the united states they still do not want to take down the content or to moderate it because they have no liability they have a broad protection here and that has led to something like what they say is that i hear something called cesspools now what are cesspools cesspools are services that solicit and profit from anti-social content uh, now i think that's a that's a broad statement to make uh, because uh, empirically we have seen that there have been some platforms like Juicy Campus, which used to be there, which was the purpose of it was primarily to provide, uh, like to let people throw dirt at each other, like write defamatory or offensive content about each other. And those platforms have failed. And now let's just look at it like reputable platforms, which are there like uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, or uh, like, uh, 
Google, you know, Google, if we don't, not Google, like let's say Facebook, none of these really want their platforms to, to leave a bad taste in, in, with their consumers right now. So even without the US law requiring them to, to have certain conditions to get the safe harbor, they are already coming up with certain terms and conditions, the policies for the consumer as to what sort of content you can piece and what sort of content you cannot. And that in this case, we would take down the content. This is all voluntary. They're doing it because they want to develop a trust with people. But uh, that's not enough right now for according to a lot of uh, senators and the critiques of uh, uh, Section 230 because they feel is that now internet when this provision came up did not have these uh, monopolistic players right now which we have uh, which we have like look at google look at facebook and what people are feeling is at least uh, the ones who are critiques of it that this is affecting our democratic right to get the information in some way or the other because everyone's accessing information by these platforms so how they are moderating it, like what sort of content is served to you or an XYZ person, they are tweaking it. Uh, Republicans on one side, they say that this is leading to some sort of a social media bias, that these corporations, uh, uh, like what they're doing is people, they're all based in Silicon Valley and they feel that they have a left-leaning, yeah, left-leaning uh, like sort of a political ideology. So they would engage in, uh, practices which would be detrimental to the conservatives in the America. Whereas the where, where, whereas the Democrats feel that these guys are not doing enough to take down the content. Uh, because what happened during the 2016 uh, US uh, presidential elections was, uh, like if I have to give you some statistics, uh, I, there were about 3000 election ads which were purchased by Russian operatives. Um, there were about 156 million fake news stories, sorry, 156 fake news stories that were shared 38 million times. Three by fourth of them were pro President Donald Trump and anti Hillary Clinton. So there's a narrative that this influenced people in such a way. And the fact that these people were not moderating the fake news or anything like that. So, uh, this warrants the change in section 230 and one of the other things which people who are not necessarily coming from politics argue for the amendments to this is purely because of the harassment this is leading to so for, i'll give you an example uh, there's a there's an ongoing there was an ongoing case in the united states uh, there's an app called grinder uh, so like a disgruntled boyfriend uh, took the picture of his previous boyfriend posted it online and uh, started inviting people so there were about 1200 times that people followed him, stalked this other guy. Um, to the extent it was causing him harassment, he had to seek some medical uh, treatment. But when they went to the court uh, to, to get some sort of protection for it, uh, under Section 230, Grinder said, I'm not doing anything. I have the complete protection here. And the court, without even delving into some other common law uh, narratives about whether product liability could be imposed or not, uh they didn't really go into it but purely under section 230 nothing could be done to grinder so a lot of people are saying that the access to justice is also not there for us because of this provision because the protection is so broad and that's why there are uh, arguments as to why some changes need to be brought to it now in the world uh i have a different perception of it like what sort of changes should be there uh but uh, later at the stage mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you how the us at least has uh uh, taken certain measures to come up with carve outs and in my view how those carve outs have completely failed so oh, that is very interesting to know also with the use of practical examples and uh, the statistics that you have given with respect to the u.s president debate is something that i'll come back to in the q a because that seems to be pretty interesting that how uh, you know uh, rules can be flouted in the way or loopholes can be seen to impact uh, decisions like elections. Uh, that is the allegation at least. Uh, coming to Prashagra now, so we here back home have uh, intermediary guidelines and there's a huge scope and aim uh, with respect to these guidelines uh, themselves. Would you like to give us a broad overview of the guidelines and what are some of the contentious issues, the uh, limitations and the potential of the intermediary guidelines and what aspects do you find uh, to be problematic? What aspects do you find to be uh, positive uh, with respect to these intermediary guidelines. 
Kushal, over to you. So, yeah. So, in light of uh, the discussion we just had uh, of the scenario in India with respect to the problems that we have, uh, the government uh, felt the need to amend the intermediary guidelines and it uh, brought out the draft uh, information technology intermediary guidelines rules uh, 2018, which was brought out on 24 December 2018. Now, uh, there are a lot of problems with the rules. I'll focus on the major ones here. Uh, the first one is the compulsory local office requirement. So the one of the rules makes it um, compulsory for in intermediaries who are having more than 50 lakh uh, users in India to be created in India and to have a permanent office in the country. Now, the first problem with this provision uh, is that it is not clear how the assessment of the user base is going to be done. Is it going to be uh, on the basis of clicks? Is it going to be the number of registered users or is it going to be monthly visitors, annual visitors? That is not clear. Now, uh, it is also not clear. Uh, the fact is that this provision is going to create an additional hardship as well as a financial burden on these intermediaries. Now, a lot of these companies operate on a model which which thrives on the fact that you don't need to have a physical space or you don't need to have an office as such. Uh, so that is one problem that we are going to have. Uh, a lot of multinationals are not going to be very happy about it. The second one is the traceability requirement. So this is also an issue which is pending before the court, uh, the Supreme Court. Now, uh, the, the rule says that if asked by the government, the intermediaries would have to trace the originator of the content in question. Now, the problem with uh, imposing such a restriction is that it weakens or uh, 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 it weakens encryption. Now, what is encryption? Encry encryption is a technology that protects uh, the the data that you share over the internet, uh, which is exchanged between two people uh, over a platform on the internet. Right now, we know that WhatsApp and other texting apps use end-to-end -end encryption. Now, that may not be possible if traceability requirements were to be imposed uh, upon the, those intermediaries. That is one problem. Now, the other problem, the third problem is the takedown requirements. Uh, with uh, In the guidelines, it's mentioned that an intermediary would be compelled to remove or disable access to data hosted on their platform within a period of 24 hours. Now, there are issues with the feasibility of such provision. Firstly, uh, you don't you don't necessarily have to comply with this just because the government is telling you to do this. Because if that were the case, uh, it would allow the government to have more powers to control the flow of data and information on the intermediate on the online space, which affects freedom of speech and expression. Secondly, there are also problems with uh, implementation of this technology, which is going to add uh, add a more financial burden on intermediaries, especially small startups. Uh, the next major problem with uh, the draft provision, the draft rules, is the upload filters. Now, uh, the rule makes it uh, compulsory for intermediaries to deploy automated tools uh, or processes to identify and remove uh, or to disable uh, public access to unlawful information or content. Provision is that the intermediaries themselves have to sit in judgment to be able to decide what content is lawful and what content is not lawful. This is a gross violation of what was held in the Shreya Single Judgment. We said that content can only be removed once you receive an order from the government or you receive an order from the court. Uh, also, this is going to require a lot of technical expertise, and this requires a technology which is still in development. This is this is not a technology that is fully accessible or fully developed. Moreover, we are going to have problems in India because we have uh, 22 official languages. Now, people could be communicating with each other on the online space in more than one language. People could be talking uh, uh, in, in a bil bilingual tone and you will not be able to apply those filters or it will require some exceptional technical expertise, which is again. Uh, these are problems broadly with the guideline that it, it has implications on uh, privacy rights. It has implications on freedom of speech and expression. And therefore, it's it's uh, important for us to have these discussions uh, and uh, send representations to the government. Uh, SFLC has done that. SFLC has sent its representations to the government in this regard, pointing out the inaccuracies in the provisions of the draft rules. That is very insightful and gives us an uh, interesting overview of what the intermediary guidelines, uh, so to speak, entail for all of us. Thank you, Kushagra, for that.
Uh, now moving on to Kabir, we live in a globalized world and there are uh, implications of laws in one country, if not uh, limited to jurisdiction, but there are certainly implications of uh, laws or guidelines in one country on another. And uh, in this context, we would like to understand your views on the impact of the draft intermediary guidelines which have been uh, instituted in India to the US companies. Hmm. So uh, I'll just talk about, uh, before I'll tell you, uh, I mean, uh, how the cowards in the United States laws um, have really not turned out well. And then I'll tell you the repercussions which the Indian, uh, like the Indian regulations may have it uh, on, 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 on the companies in the United States. Uh, like as I mentioned, the section 230, even though it provides for broad protections is still uh, working. Uh, there, there have been, the government has come up with certain cowards uh, one, the president came up with an executive order. Uh, like it hasn't materialized, thankfully, but he said that they would attempt amend the section 230C, uh, where the good faith standard, which was there for moderating, that will be administered by a federal trade commission. The federal trade commission is, has appointees by the president itself, and that's similar to the bureaucrats. And that is something which at least the United States people won't prefer because that could always have, uh, like such moderation could always have political leanings. One of the uh, carve outs which has been signed recently is it's called FOSTA and SESTA. Uh, the full form of it is FOSTA is Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Um, what essentially it does is that uh, the purpose of it is to, to stop promoting activities uh, uh, about, uh, sorry, punishing activities about uh, which promote sex trafficking. So, what essentially it does is that it says that the protections of Section 230. Uh, communications decency act which are there they won't apply to this civil and criminal cases of sex, tra sex trafficking or conduct that promotes it online now prima facie everyone thinks okay yeah sex trafficking is bad this should not happen but uh, surprisingly not surprisingly major protest to this uh, law came from people who engage in a like uh, not sex trafficking but uh, like uh, I don't want to like whatever you were like something like uh, prostitution things like that. Uh, they said that this could lead to chilling effects on our right and this is uh, so and it rightly so happened so Craigslist is a big platform in the United States which uh, where you can put out advertisements for sale or anything and it used to have a personal column section there now what it did was that uh, Craigslist to avoid any sort of liability completely shut down that personal column section how uh, these uh, people who used to engage in like these activities how did they ended up suffering was because uh, it made them more vulnerable because they used to use these platforms to share blacklists of people who they did not want to engage into the sex trade with uh these platforms were used for sharing health and safety information uh health and safety information about their clients and uh, essentially all of this stopped because the platforms really feared that okay they could be held liable and it's always cheaper to or on the side of just moderating it and taking down the content rather than like if if a complaint comes to you to moderate it and someone says okay this is bad you would just err on the side key all right like and, and your safe harbor is conditional upon that empirically it's been seen seen that the company would be like okay i'm going to take this content down rather than getting mod into the controversy so that that really has not worked out well in the united states as i feel and uh, it really defeats the purpose of uh, what uh, uh, like 230 wanted to achieve that we we try to get as much of uh, a lot of information like good information online and we try to avoid as much uh, bad information as possible without really having a stick in our hand over these because that can have uh, like like a negative uh, uh, approach to like a negative impact in these platforms now coming to the United States, coming to the Indian laws, which are there, like uh, um, use of auto filters and everything. What I feel is that uh, Indian, 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 uh, uh, the amendments which are there to the in in intermediary guidelines, they're a knee-jerk re response and they restrict internet to just understanding that it's Facebook, it's Google, uh, and it's Netflix and these big platforms. Uh, it doesn't understand that by getting such laws or even in the United States by doing away with the law like 230 you end up killing the internet and you practically shut the door for any new entrance uh, so 
a company like take for an example uh wikipedia like it runs an encyclopedia which is used throughout the world but it runs as a non-profit organization that cannot afford to have an office in in india where you can have a 24-hour executive or to use something like automated filters and i'm sure like kushagri would have spoken to you about how uh, automated filters have their own problems that they cannot filter the content on the basis of the context like whatever it's uh, like uh, they, the filters don't understand the context and the tonality in the way things are said and the other thing is that the united states free speech laws are really broad so something like every day every third day in india you, the content is taken down uh, which may end up offending some some politician here and there like the names of the communities are muted from content online uh the john oliver's episode was not even hosted where it was critical about the indian prime minister so that's the united states does not does not like such like restricted free speech laws and that is something which which will impact like that, that, that is the dichotomy here that like here under the indian the new indian laws you could practically get a lot of stuff banned but u.s regime does not allow it like here people believe in the propagation of things uh the other thing is about uh, i think us really takes uh, uh, um, seriously the end to end encryption even though there have been some bills uh, in the congress to provide backdoor entries of it and there have been some joint letters by some representatives to provide it but uh, right now that has not been successful and the fact that the traceability aspect of the indian laws which requires it to provide them to that will re essentially require them to create a backdoor from end to end encryption what we like the messages which we share on whatsapp etc uh i think that's something which is going to be a problem and um, yes it's fine like yeah, like it's it's india's sovereignty it's india's law but try and understand most of the companies which are providing these innovations are coming from united states and like you're just depriving them of such a big market and with no right like with no legitimate basis that these these rules are going to be effective like obviously it's not that india does not have the sovereignty to decide the laws and everything but i don't think these laws are well thought through and it'll just end up killing the indian internet also like country which is looking to be the next uh, it hub no new startups would be able to come up because all their resources would be put in towards litigation or getting these filters automated filters or providing for these technologies of traceability and things like that Thank you. That's very interesting. Uh, what about uh, you, Kushagra? Would you like to add something to what Kabir just said? Yeah, just one small point uh, in respect of uh, the Wikipedia illustration. So the Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Foundation had actually written to the IT minister in response to the draft rules. And uh, the letter said that the proposed rules might have a serious impact on uh, Wikipedia's open editing model and would create a significant uh, financial burden for non-profit technology organizations. Similarly, a lot of other uh, international organizations who work in this space have also written to the IT minister uh, saying that there are serious problems with the rules and you should reconsider them. Okay, that is a good point that you've added from the Indian context. Uh, both of you have really highlighted a number of key issues during the uh, talk today, uh, some of which have a lot of social implications and implications on the rule of law, democracy, and how elections are conducted across the world. Uh, uh, the point being fake news, online harassment, and other kinds of vulnerabilities that uh, internet users sort of uh, pose themselves to. Uh, these are some of the risks that uh, we undergo on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes just uh, not paying attention to what kind of risks uh, are being uh, posed to us. So how do you think uh, they should be, or the ways and means through which uh, such vulnerabilities should be mitigated over the internet uh, be handled in India? Kushagra, to you first. So basically yeah. the question is so, uh, comes to and online harassment and things which make internet users vulnerable uh, suddenly we are not doing a good job at it so how can the government of india really take up the mantle of effectively enforcing certain laws certain regulations in terms of uh, mitigating the risks that internet users go through 
when they use the internet yes so i think uh, there are two aspects to it uh, one is that you have to increase accountability on part of the users firstly that they don't indulge in such activities and for that you have to uh, and uh, you have to make law enforcement more aware of these issues and you have to make sure everybody who does something illegal on the online space uh, gets justice in respect of online harassment or such illegalities which are committed on the online space secondly i think in respect of uh, spread of misinformation and uh, similar problems i think as the courts have also advised and uh, in in terms of scalability of the problem the the sheer magnitude of this problem i think one good step would be to uh, initiate awareness about such issues because a lot of us in different parts of the country are not aware of the the verifiability of the information that you're getting a lot of people think that if they receive a forward on whatsapp it it must be true since it's written it's in the written word it must be true so i think that awareness uh, needs to come to all of us that uh, it might be fake news it might not be verified information so do not forward it so awareness is the key i believe okay that's very interesting to know uh, kapil what is the scenario uh, in terms of fake news and online harassment when it comes to us law of course you touched upon it briefly but uh, in my knowledge the scenario uh, is not even comparative between us and india when it comes to the development of jurisprudence and the infrastructure when it comes to fake news and uh, online harassment are they doing a better job in one line are, are the us authorities doing a better job when it comes to fake news and online harassment and other related vulnerabilities that internet users pose themselves to so the authorities are certainly talking about it whether they are doing a good job or not is something which we'll have to assess uh, in my view they're not doing a good job as i explained it to you how their uh, fasta and sesta carve outs really don't work uh, there are some pending bills right now uh, which provide for certifications uh, i mean which won't see the light of the day essentially but uh, there's a bill which talks about uh, uh, getting a certification of moderation to these guys based on based on some guidelines mentioned by some federal ftc authorities like that that they are doing a good faith uh, moderation and that's the standard which would be determined by the representative of the government of the day uh, so uh, in my view uh, uh, like uh, these uh, getting an external uh, yeah, like influence of the government to to reduce down the 230s protections is really not going to help uh, in terms of sexual harassment yes there have been an increase of the cases but we should try to understand there is always a require there's already a requirement uh, for for uh, for these intermediaries to report when it comes to comes it to their knowledge uh, of any uh, child abuse c spam c spam content uh, content which is there like uh, child sexual abuse material what they're trying to do is like currently the standard I think we lost to there, Kabir. Uh, I think Kabir is facing some technical issue. Uh, he'll be back in a few seconds. Yeah. So, uh, so meanwhile, uh, Kushagra, why don't you um, why don't you take up a few? Okay, so we have lost Kabir. Uh, I think he's facing some technical issues, but yeah. we could uh, I think keep I'll, on chatting yeah. till the time uh, Kabir joins us. that would be a few moments so my question uh, which i would like to pose to you uh, after this uh, amazing discussion that we have had where we have had a background of intermediary guidelines we know what's happening in india and us we also know the teething issues and what the governments in respective countries are doing right and what the governments in respective countries are doing wrong so uh, today we are in times uh, in very unprecedented times of covid-19 situation where the world is being forced to uh take up technology and there is a moment of digital revolution so though the consumers are uh, in a way getting accustomed to uh, this online world uh, do you think uh, we have hope in terms of the regulators uh, coming in and uh, ensuring that vulnerabilities on the internet are something that are mitigated uh, do you think they are going to be proactive now considering that we are already in a 
stage of digital revolution. So is there hope that uh, even the regulators will fasten their pace of reacting to uh, the changes on the Internet? So uh, that is one of the problems uh, in this in the digital space, and that is one of been uh, that has been one of the peculiar problems in India also. That uh, technology obviously evolves much faster, and it takes a lot of time for law to do the catching up part. So now the problem here is that with the intermediary, the draft I intermediary guidelines. Okay, Kabir is back. So, uh, Kabir, uh, Kushagra is just finishing a point, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, uh, Kushagra, please continue. Yeah, so uh, so the problem with the rules is that uh, they make it so difficult and, and we we are still not certain about what will the liability that will be incurred upon intermediaries if they don't follow with what the government asks them to do in terms of takedown requirements or upload filters. So uh, the intermediaries are going to be over cautious. They are going to be very, very proactive with respect to filtering content with, with respect to imposing uh, content moderation policies so that is going to attack the very structure of the internet which is which is uh, the remarkable thing about the internet is the freedom that we have to be able to say anything of course with the restrictions but here that is going to be affected people are going to be uh, more cautious it's also going to have have a chilling effect on the intermediaries as well as uh, the users on their platform so that is one of the problems which is there with the rules Okay, thank you so much. Kabir, over to you. You can complete your uh, answer before we lost uh, you. Uh, you. I think you are, you need to unmute yourself, Kabir. Could you could you tell me like where did like where did my connection go away? Like at what point? Probably you could repeat the last ten seconds of uh, what you were saying. You were at the point where. Uh, you were talking about uh, well, even the uh, government in the US is not doing a great job. That's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. yes. So, yeah, like the thing is, uh, as I explained before, that the car votes which they came out with, they're not really doing well. Um, in terms of uh, uh, sexual, like uh, C-SPAM con uh, uh, content, like C-SPAM content, like child sexual abuse material, there's already an obligation for them to report it uh, and the standard for it is that once they get the knowledge of it, but right now what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the, change the standard to that, like if there's recklessness or negligence, but that's not possible. Like that's that's such a really low standard because so much of uh, data is uploaded, and it's not that these platforms are really not taking an effort. Uh, until last year itself, uh, 45 million cases were voluntarily reported by these. Uh, platforms online which is there uh, what i feel is that uh, if uh, if we go ahead with this approach in the united states uh, uh, in the united states it's it's really gonna kill the internet as we know it uh, had i spoken about how the indian laws are going to affect it uh, i think i had spoken about this before um, yes. so like i don't know what the exact ways to tackle these uh, issues because definitely there are big issues right now uh, we need to hold these guys like these platforms more accountable considering like people are using them for information and obviously we don't want them to affect the democratic uh, election process just for the purposes of them earning some money by selling the targeted data like this uh, what i feel is that uh, some accountability measures in terms of transparency as to how they sell the data and uh, how they are uh, like uh, moderating some sort of fake news that that would be preferred and i think uh, some of the instances have already been highlighted how twitter has been uh, twitter has gone to the extent of even uh, like uh, tagging the president's tweet uh, uh, president's tweet that uh, like it could be of suspicious material but if we like, I'll, I'll honestly tell you, if you open up the India's regime, it's bound to get abused politically, uh, like for political gain, and it will lead to some sort of chilling effects as uh, Kushagra already highlighted. So, I mean, that's my submission. I don't know what can be done effectively, but I know what should definitely not be done. And what India is doing and what US is currently doing, that should definitely not be done. That's a good starting point to know uh, the things that are not working and then move forward from there. 
Uh, one of the key, so now we are moving to the Q and A, and we have received a number of questions. Certainly, this topic has, uh, and your talk has uh, garnered a lot of interest. And there's so many young minds grappling with so many issues, and they would like the experts to answer uh, those questions. But the first question that I would like to begin with is by saying that, what are your views on censorship of, over the internet? And when it comes to the most pressing issue of our times, is that whether internet should be regulated? If yes. Then to what extent and what are the rights that get harmed or the competing rights uh, involved in this discussion? So just to know a practitioner's view, a view of a person who was deeply, uh, deeply entrenched in this topic, that uh, when you look at the regulation of the internet, whether it should be regulated or not, and to what extent, and if regulated, then what are the competing rights uh, around that, uh, around that infrastructure of technology? Uh, let's start with Kushagru. Yeah, so uh, internet censorship in India happens in varied forms. Like there's website blocking, there's internet shutdowns. Uh, there's now we'll have uh, content moderation also, and there are takedown requests. Now, I think the key to having a free and open internet is, of course, we do have problems and we can have reasonable restrictions also. Uh, but I think the key to solving this problem is to have transparency in the uh, So <clears throat> the law provides that you have to follow a certain procedure and the law also provides that you have to bring out orders in respect of every single action that the government takes. But that does not happen a lot of times. Specifically in respect of internet shutdowns, a lot of times the government uh, follows through with the internet shutdown, but the orders don't come. The orders are nowhere to be found. Similarly, in case of website blocking also a lot of times there isn't a lot of transparency as to why the websites were blocked or or if the those intermediaries or those websites were given an opportunity to be heard as to uh, how they address this problem and how they uh, get their website to be unblocked or that censorship to be removed in respect of their website. So I think transparency is a key and adhering to the procedure which is there in a uh, which is written in the laws and the regulations is to be followed is the key. Sure, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kapi, do you, would you like to add to that? Selena, I think it's already being regulated a lot. Uh, I don't think we need to regulate it any further. Uh, we could, uh, like, but like the trend which I've seen in different countries, like we, the European Union, Australia, Singapore, all of them have started coming up with some sort of legislations, uh, like in terms of fake news and some fines and like uh, the EU copyright directive. I mean, if we get time, we should talk about it sometime later as to uh, like, oh, like the kind of fines I which mean, are being, uh, but like what I, what I think is this is a, this is a worrisome trend for me. I, I don't agree with the, like such censorship. Uh, because inter internet's been a beautiful platform and it has only evolved because we have kept away from it and we have let it uh, grow the way it has come out to be right now. Uh, and awkward could be replaced by Facebook because a startup did not have so many uh, obligations when it was starting off. And if we come up with these, uh, we already have such a cumbersome uh, uh, copyright removal obligations for these intermediaries like the ip uh, like whatever the copyrighted content is in terms of other censorships like you already have broad rules if you're going to get some more like different sub regulation it's just going to make it difficult for other players to come in so sure. that's my broad view that's that's very interesting and it's related to my second question which i wanted to ask you both of you is mm -hmm. that by regulating the internet and getting into the space of over-regulation uh, slowly and steadily. Uh, aren't we curbing the growth of the new age online startups? Because even before they start, they have so many compliances, so many things to be followed. And uh, simply, uh, it is difficult to even understand uh, what are the regulations that apply to them and some of them that they don't. And then they come to lawyers, which is good for lawyers, to understand what uh, compliances should be followed by them. So in a way, we are curbing creativity, <coughs> we are curbing enterprise. We are also curbing young minds to find solutions to global problems. Uh, you took a very good example of Facebook and Orkut and the different times wherein you didn't have so many regulators and so many regulations. Therefore, there was, was a 
uh, chance and an environment wherein new online startups, uh, new age online startups could come and, uh, and you know, uh, they could grow. But today the times are different. So what do you want to say about that? The regulation of online startups. Are we slowly moving into the place of over-regulation? I hope now yes. I'll begin. Yeah, go ahead, Vishal. Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, having worked in a having worked in a technology startup also, I can sometimes relate to it because there's there's so many regulations. Even along with the IT Act, there's so many regulations. Uh, forget about the people who are working for these startups, but sometimes it gets difficult for the lawyers themselves to understand and get around all these regulations. A lot of these regulations are not followed. A lot of the government uh, agencies themselves don't understand uh, the implication of the regulations they draft the the ground uh, the effect uh, on the ground which those regulations and uh, policies are going to have on the startups so similarly in this case also the intermediary uh, liability uh, guideline rules as they stand they hit on the very idea of the internet and if implemented it would actually alter the way internet functions in india now the thing with the internet is that it's a remarkable tool as kabir said which facilitates democratization of societies by giving a platform to the people to freely express themselves and it's also we've seen in the past that it's proven to be very useful in rescuing democracies from the clutches of tyrants and authoritarian regimes across time and space so we need to learn from that and we need to ensure that uh, internet doesn't become uh, uh, it remains and continues to be free for for everybody sure and that is very important for the uh, human development as well as development of nations in terms of uh, human potential uh, Another thing which is uh, different between US and India, uh, broadly speaking, is that rule of law is something that is uh, much more stronger in the US as compared to India. And that uh, really has a, a fallout effect on uh, the Im implementation of the intermediary guidelines and the like uh, when it comes to the regulation of the internet or making internet a safe, secure place for everyone. So what do you think? Uh, how much is our potential of achieving anything, if at all, when the rule of law is weak in our country as compared to the US? And likewise, Kabir, why do you think uh, these things turn up to be uh, taken much more seriously as compared to India? And what can India do? for these things to be taken as seriously as that is, that is in the US. Yes, Kushagra. I think it's uh, it's important for the government uh, to have more discussions with, uh, with all the stakeholders and uh, SFLC has had a considerable role to play in it. We've organized roundtables, we've organized a lot of events where we have uh, invited people from uh, across sectors, civil society, government representatives, to uh, to have these discussions so that so that we are able to discuss these problems openly and freely and to make to give the government a perspective uh, from the intermediaries side as well that these are the problems we are going to have so i think that that process before a legislation that pre legislative process is is very important for us to have so that uh, the intermediaries are not taken by surprise once these rules are out Yes, that makes uh, stakeholder uh, consultations are so important because those are the people who are grappling with the issue day in and day out and our policy makers and parliamentarians may not have that kind of insight. But unfortunately, in our legislative process, that key aspect is uh, for some uh, reason or the other uh, largely left out and has implications later on in the form of amendments after many, many years, which could have been avoided at the pre-legislative stage. And that's a very important and pertinent point that you have made so far. Uh, what about you, Kabir? What do you think the Indian, what could change in the Indian scenario broadly uh, for things to be taken seriously? The government. Yes, by the government, by the people, just the respect of law, the rule of law, uh, how could that be enforced much more strongly and strengthened in this country? I know one way is to yeah. a lot of institutions, to... memory and infrastructure, but what else would you like to contribute to this? I mean, I'm sitting outside, so I think I can take the liberty to say it. I think this government really needs to chill out and uh, become a bit more tolerant. And if it doesn't, I think people really should develop a thick skin in India to take the criticism and realize that uh, like if, if a movie is made about a mythological queen of Rajputs, that's not insulting to them. And 
if it's highlighted that Rajputs lost a war, they did lose a war. So there's nothing insulting in that. And a joke on a warrior is 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 still fine. Like it's it's and the government should stop giving into these things. And in the light of these trying to overregulate the internet also as to whatever is posted online. So I think that would be a good start. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, it's, but still, India is relatively like a, is a young democracy. It's, it's a 70 year old democracy compared to, compared to the United States, which has been there since like 70, 1700s or so. So, uh, I mean, I, I think we, we have the benefit of doubt and we've, we've really come far in the last 70 years. Like we have had some beautiful constitutional jurisprudence. So we should not get disheartened by the last eight, nine years as to what's been going on. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll rise back. Uh, I'm sure you're coming from a space wherein you're a concerned citizen. You have had the world knowledge now, having studied at mm. premier institutions abroad. And I'm sure young minds like you can come back and, uh, you know, institutionalize some of these things, some of these ideas. Because today, we are, what we are failing at is we are failing at the stage of ideation and then implementation. So, firstly, we have to cultivate and fully form those ideas and then try and implement them. Uh, so the government is trying its best and you know the environment mm. is there such that the cultural and social fabric is such that there's so many uh, so many uh, preconditions there's so many permutations and combinations there's so many communities that you uh, really need to uh, prioritize national security you have to prioritize uh, harmony uh, more than sometimes uh, other factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what uh, I think as concerned citizens uh, we should look at as well. But there is no, uh, you know, there is no excuse for not having a strong rule of law in the largest democracy in the world. And that is something collectively everyone is responsible. Everyone in the system is responsible, not only the government, but the citizens. And the government is largely, uh, the, our leaders are a uh, average of what our citizens are. And that means that we have a long way to go forward. I appreciate the point where you made that we are a young democracy and we have come very far. But I also would like to uh, add a point there. Though we have come so far, uh, there's no time to rest and we should really uh, go and uh, you know increase our pace of adaptation, our pace of uh, strengthening our institutions so that there is not only law and paper, but that disconnect is bridged somehow because we know that access to justice is a big, big issue, uh, not only for the commoners today, but also for people who are slightly well off in this country. And that is a collective failure. That is not to do with one or two institutions, but with all the stakeholders and uh, wherein we have not been able to uh, really fulfill our responsibilities. Uh, so coming to uh, some of the questions, and there are some interesting questions uh, that have come uh, from the audience. And I'll be uh, I'll try and do justice to these questions in terms of the time that we have. Um, so Anushka has a very interesting question. She uh, would like to know uh, Kushagra's views on the constitutionality of the recent ban by the Indian government for multiple Chinese applications under Section 69 of the IT Act. So what is the constitutionality of this, and uh, what are your views on uh, banning uh, Chinese apps in India? So, uh, I think uh, a detailed conversation on the constitutionality of that move would require a much uh, longer discussion. But uh, I would like to add that uh, maybe in, in the short short term, maybe it's a plausible, maybe it's a feasible move, I would say. But in the longer run, I, need, I think we need to have a fixated policy, like we need to have a wartime policy, we need to have a peacetime cyber policy that takes care of uh, all these issues. We can't uh, always afford to have a reactionary uh, response to these issues and uh, geopolitical uh, issues which cross over on, on the tech side. Sure, that uh, makes complete sense. And I think that that's justice to the question. Uh, there is a question by, let me just uh, get the idea of it. Uh, it is, um, by Samarpreet Gupta for Kabir, one of the key pressing issues during current times is that courts are operating through virtual hearings. However, they are not being made public. Do you think the court is liable to make their hearings public? 
what are the changes the government should uh, bring to the current IT Act to change face to face uh, in order to uh, make these hearings public? So basically, in a nutshell, the question is that today, uh, due to the COVID-19 unprecedented times, everyone is in a lockdown. Those lower courts are not operating, but high courts and supreme courts are uh, virtually operating uh, on an online mode. Now these hearings are not public and Tamar Prizukta would like to know that uh, is there a way uh, wherein the IT Act can be amended so that the hearings of the court are public in nature? I know the answer to this, but please, Kabir, let's uh, hear your views on it. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good move right now, like what, what's, what's being suggested and I think it, it should be done. Uh, the thing is, the IT Act has nothing to do with it. Uh, like. IT Act will not be like you cannot amend an IT Act to provide the Supreme Court to Supreme Court hearings to be made public online. Uh, I I think, uh, but in the longer run, I think India has been struggling with this debate. Uh, SCOTUS, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, already provides for audio recordings of the hearings to be given and later circulated. And I think there have been a couple of uh, demands for that in India as well. And not just in not just at the court level, but even like the select committees at the parliament, like uh, unless it relates to something really like the defense or like the national security, I think those should also be made public. Like I'll go a step further to say like the way the Congress does it in the United States. But the US, like the IT Act has nothing to do with it. And with respect to the other question about which was asked to Kushagra uh, about the constitutionality of the ban. So, it's, 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 the question, uh, like, I, I, I try to reframe the question because it's about the legality of the ban. The constitutionality is about the provision which is there in the IT Act, and that enables the government to ban anything over the internet, provided it complies with the reasons. Why they did it, I think it was a pretty jingoistic reason why they did it, because TikTok did not change their policies overnight. The data collection or the abuse, everyone's been aware of if that has been going on. Well and good if that re if that was the th if that was the case if that was uh, like uh, if that was the reason why they did it, but if it's triggered from some jingoistic point of view or to promote something like data localization, I think it's a bad move. But legality of it is something which the court will have to decide. I mean, not not even the court like the committee will have to decide because right now the committees have been, like the apps have been asked to report to the committee that whether you are taking away the data also or not. So let's see. Yes, that's uh, interesting to know and uh, the point about constitutional legality is also something that uh, is good that you pointed out because uh, for anything to be uh, to be uh, passed with the government it has to uh, meet the tenets of the constitution and if not then it will certainly be challenged in the court of law uh, there's a question to Shagra about uh, content moderation laws so basically Pankhu Chavla is thinking a little bit in the future and saying that what are your thoughts on harmonization of content moderation laws around the world to an international organization? Example, in the case of Human Rights of the United Nations, with restrictions on what governments can and cannot do, given that the internet is global in nature. I am sure it's a humongous task and the enforceability uh, would be a big problem. But what do you think about something like a global international organization which deals with issues that everyone is grappling through. Though in the times of WHO, people are not really happy with having international organizations in humongous bureaucratic setups. But the idea is that, is that a possibility? Would it serve some purpose? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great idea. And I think this is something that is eventually going to happen because uh, around the world countries are uh, taking content moderation seriously. We are seeing that happening all around the world in the US, of course, in European nations and in India also, we've just discussed the guidelines and uh, we, we do understand that section 79 also, the safe harbor provision also was in fact, uh, there was an impact of, it was based on the European Union's e-commerce directive of 2000. So that is how international law can affect uh, domestic legislation. Also, we can take inspiration. We can take we can, we can learn from uh, those directives or those laws which are which are uh, which are being drafted by other countries or international organizations. They can there is going to be shortly a directive as well. 
uh, that is what I have to say. But I would love to hear Kabir's uh, views on this. I think he yes. can contribute to this. Speak about it. Thank you, Kushal. Uh, I'm not sure I got the question properly, but I think in terms of the intermediary liability, we're already talking about broad principles. I mean, something as back as 2015, the Manila principles are already there as to what are some of the things which should be followed in terms of intermediary liability. To what extent the countries follow it, it depends. Uh, I think this entire regime uh, of uh, of, of uh, prioritizing data localization in, some, in India is something something worrisome for me. But like, what's the question? Like, we come up with the globe. Like, I, I didn't follow the question exactly. Uh, international organizations which deals with all of these issues that uh, world economies are grappling with. So, in terms of human rights, you have UN. So, do you need an organization which deals with all of these issues? I think we are already discussing it at some forums, uh, like uh, the Internet Governance Forum, uh, I can, um, but uh, I've never thought of it, uh, like a part of it in terms of the domain names and everything that's already been handled by an international organization, but I've really not thought of uh, content moderation, how effective it will be, because every country has really like different principles, but haven't we already discussed it under the existing laws like the ICCPR and everything? So I think it'll just uh, maybe I didn't follow the question correctly, but uh, I don't think I don't see it as a real possibility. But sure. All right, so you have different views on that. Uh, there's a question uh, specifically in the Indian context by Sudarshan. Uh, what he's saying really is that you have this IT Act and you have this whole infrastructure around technology laws in India, uh, but according to him, the penalties and the liabilities uh, flowing from the IT Acts are not strong enough. Uh, so what could be done in that regard in order to safeguard the interest of the uh, stakeholders in this infrastructure? So if Shall I heard you correctly, uh, it said they are not they are not strong enough. Is that what he meant? Because yeah, uh, yeah because I really think I I I beg to differ because the penalties are really huge. But um, that is what he means. But actually, one, one could reframe this question and say that well, even if the penalties are high and the IT Act has a lot of uh, you know, progressive uh, provisions actually, uh, the implementation might not be uh, to the extent that we want. Uh, any which ways, uh, the way in which you would like to respond, over to you, Gushal. So, yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think one thing that we can do is that we anyways have an obsession with uh, uh, criminalization of, uh, like imposing criminal liability in, even in civil offenses. Oh. So I think that is one thing where we can have a shift uh, where a criminal liability, which is there in a lot of provisions in the IT Act, we can turn that into civil liability. We can impose fines and a lot of a lot of times uh, that might be an incentive, but only in certain provisions, not, not as a broad principle. We shouldn't be imposing fines and penalties. Uh, it, it should be a lot of uh, proactive compliances from on behalf of the, the citizens or the companies themselves as well. Uh, so yeah, that is there. In in respect of implementation, I think uh, the authorities need to be a little more proactive about it because a lot of places we see that that the law enforcement also are not aware of really how how these provisions are supposed to play out or how how they are supposed to be understood in the right context or applied in in a particular context as well. So uh, in my experience, also I have seen a few cases where uh, law enforcement authorities have also. Uh, quoted incorrect provisions in in some of the circulars or notifications or orders. So I think that uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of education or or uh, technical expertise also needs to be uh, given to uh, the government authorities as well, so that we can have a, a better system of implementation. So that is uh, that is very insightful. Uh, the last question that I'm going to take from the audience, and then I'm going to ask a few questions of my own considering the positive time otherwise there are about you got about 30 plus questions and i was able to club a few questions and ask you and some of them have gone uh, unattended uh, but the question that i would like to ask you which is from one of the attendees is that uh, 
there are a number of environmental law websites which were uh, taken down. Uh, so these websites were pertaining to NGOs and uh, which were criticizing some of the draft legislation which are being tabled in the parliament. Uh, now, because of their criticism, uh, their websites have been taken down by the government of India, and that has uh, created a huge uproar uh, within the activist community uh, and also uh, interested uh, people interested in environmental issues. So the question is that where where do you draw the line? Where will this stop? Why can't the uh, people in the government take solid criticism? Uh, around the bill because eventually these are the people who are working uh, at the grassroots level and might have a different take on a particular bill that is being tabled in the parliament. So what is your view on that Kushagra and then uh, Kabir? So uh, I think we've already answered this question uh, in respect of uh, I've already said that there needs to be a proper procedure which is to be followed. If you're blocking one website or you're blocking 100 websites, you need to follow a proper procedure. <clears throat> you need to state those reasons that this is why we are blocking the websites. So that, and you need to have an order in place. You need to have a notification which is available to the public. This is also in line with the various guidelines which have been uh, issued by the Supreme Court, specifically uh, in the Anradha Basin judgment also, also in line with natural justice principles so that somebody who is facing this problem can at least challenge this in court. You have a copy of the order with you. So that is one thing that the government needs to uh, be a little more aware of, be a little more proactive about. Uh, that's that's about it from my side. Over to Kabir. Um, I'm sorry, I have not followed that pretty much, but uh... I think I'd agree with what you said. Taking down NGO websites and uh, because they have a criticism of a particular bill that is being tabled in the parliament, is that something that we would like to encourage in the Indian context or are there ways and means to sort oh, of... Well, not. I mean, not at all. I, I, I think not just that. Uh, I'll go to the extent... Uh, like there's another organization which has been banned, which just used to... Uh, talk about the idea of the Sikh community to hold a non-binding referendum on the right to self-determination. Uh, I think India as a mature democracy should allow debates on that as well to, to that extent. So any any sort of ban which is content agnostic, which is not content agnostic, uh, I don't agree with it. I think the standard should be really, really high, like the way it is there in the United States. Uh, like it really need to go through some strict scrutiny. It, it, we don't follow the same exact the way it's been done here. But I, I, I would say anything, any any sort of bans which are not content agnostic and content specific, like there should be a really high threshold. And any sort of discussions, like no matter how unfavorable it is, unless it's leading to like an imminent lawless action or stuff like that there would be different standards in india like that should not like though that content should be allowed to be there sure thank you Kabir. so one thing that is pretty clear from uh the discussion that we have had today and thank you for this creative experience uh, and i thank you on behalf of all the attendees today and people who will be viewing this later is that uh, US and India both are grappling with very similar kind of issues. Uh, US is a way forward, uh, uh, is a step forward from India, but it's not like they have resolved all the issues. There are still uh, ethical dilemmas. There are dilemmas with respect to competing rights. There are dilemmas with respect to the fast changing face of the internet. And with respect to India, we're still uh, digesting the idea of internet taking over our lives and what it means and i think there are a lot of uh, because we do not have so many young leaders uh, when it comes to the parliament there's a lot of explanation to be made or at least a lot of expertise that is required for the uh, for the integrities of the issue to come through and then the solutions would follow uh, with this i have two uh, two last questions for you on the behalf of our attendees because the audience that we have today is largely comprised of aspiring law students, uh, law students who are in law school right now, and young lawyers uh, 
and academics. So on behalf of the law people who are aspiring to become law students, the question that I would like to ask you, and it is pretty contextual because right now is a time where competitive exams are taking place in India, and this is a very important decision and all three of us understand that the choice of law school can make or break your career. So uh, Kushagra and then Kabir, what are the three major things that a law student should look at uh, while choosing uh, law aspiring uh, student of law should look at while choosing a particular law school? This is the top three things that should be uh, on their priority list. Kushagra first. Uh, yeah, uh, three pointers. I think uh, the first thing is, of course, uh, you should read as much as you uh, are able to. You should be a I mean, you should be aware of what's happening around you and around the world so that you can uh, you can match your skills with what you're looking forward to doing ahead in life. Second, I think is uh, it's it's personally it's very important of, uh, to like travel, meet a lot of people, interact with a lot of people, get a lot of perspective, intern as much as you can and be a little more serious about your internships. Try to get as much work as you can. Try to learn as much as you can about different uh, different areas. Law school is all about exploring. So explore as much you as you can. And uh, the third thing I can say, because I did uh, litigation also, is that uh, initially, at least in life, you shouldn't really be chasing money, uh, because there are a lot of ventures that initially would be very well-paying, but you would be unhappy in a job. So don't do that. Do what you really like, no matter what the struggle is in the initial years. I think eventually you will settle down. And if you keep doing what you love, you are going to excel at it and the money will of course follow okay, thank you for that uh kabir what do you think uh should law students do to develop a successful career such as yours because you have navigated the indian space and you have uh, done everything possible in new york and now you have this comparative uh comparative understanding of the indian law and the u.s law uh, certainly, there's a huge journey behind uh, what you have done and what it took for you to arrive at this point. Uh, so what are some of the things that law students could do uh, to develop a successful career such as yours? Okay. I think you're far too kind with your words. Uh, maybe that's like, maybe my career is not the best example of what successful one is because I've dabbled around with different stakeholders, right, from the industry to government to nonprofits. Uh, so, like, I've pretty much worked with everyone. Uh, but I wanted to get the experience to feel. Uh, what I'd say is, to me, like, for what really helped is uh, I just don't think of yourself as the smartest person in the room wherever you are uh, and if you are the smartest person in the room just walk out of that room because you're in the wrong room so while i was in the law school it really didn't matter to me what i was scoring very bad advice but uh, it was more about me learning stuff and uh, at least what i felt was that i couldn't do without a mentor so try to find yourself a mentor and uh, just follow what she or he says uh, after giving it a thought, I mean, but uh, have someone to guide you and you will be fine. Like, you guys are smart folks. That's very sweet. Uh, also, Kabir, three top things that you think a law student should look at, aspiring law student should look at while choosing a law school, uh, considering that these are this is a time for competitive exams and many of the uh, aspiring law students are currently taking those exams. So once they have their offers in place, what are some of the things that they should look at a potential law school? Since it's, it's an important decision in their lives, they're spending time, money, effort, and the choice of your law school can largely uh, make or break your career. Of course, there are exists. So, uh, I mean, I think one, one thing which everyone would tell you uh, is just look at the faculty which is there. Uh, one thing I'd say is just look at the alumni network. I think if you're planning to go for a foreign LLM, that would really come in handy later if you want to work abroad. And uh, third, just uh, what else would you look at? I, I, I don't know. I mean, whether it has a fancy campus with no sniffer dogs and like uh, really strict maybe. So uh, probably research, research infrastructure 
infrastructure is something that you could look at and i think it's yeah it, i think it's really important for you to play and like read so if a law school has a good library go to that one like i'd say oh yeah go to the library, law school which has a really good library go to the library read uh, kushagra yeah. would you like to add to that yes uh, i think of course uh, alumni is really important i think uh, there are factors which sometimes would dissuade a law student from joining a college like the location of the college like if it's not a very fancy city uh, those are not considerations that you should really be looking at you should look at uh, wh what is the kind of peer group you're going to get what is the kind of uh, environment in totality which would of course include infrastructure your library your uh, resources that the college has uh, that that's i think about it and and if you work out you will get uh, get a good college so that's that's it that's very valuable advice and i'm sure the attendees would appreciate that uh, with on that note i would like to thank you kushagra and kabir for taking out your time and sharing uh, your expertise in technology law with us giving us a snapshot of what it means to be a technology lawyer and grappling with issues in india and us and how these different guidelines and laws that the government of india or the government of the us comes about with and it has impact not only on our rights but on the way we lead our lives uh, in a day to day manner so thank you uh, uh, thanks a lot for taking out the time to do this and to educate uh, not only law students and aspiring uh, law students but the legal fraternity at large when it comes to uh, issues uh, that we are all faced with uh, uh, with uh, kabir uh, on the behalf of op in the global university what i would like to say that we are proud of your achievements and there is certainly a long way to go for all of us in the in the alumni network and uh, largely so uh, but whatever you have achieved so far is truly remarkable and we are proud of you as an institution and both kushagra and kabir what we would like for you to do is to keep gathering that knowledge coming back as much as you can and sharing uh, the camera of knowledge that you've gained in that span with the legal fraternity at large because uh, knowledge creation is also one of the key factors of uh, of pushing forward human potential and uh, you are not only shaping young minds but you are also contributing to national development in that way uh, with that i would like to uh, just uh, invite your closing one, one thing I, said, I, I forgot to mention i think it's really important uh, i mean uh, just just talk to the people who have graduated out of the law school as to how accessible the faculty is because i think that can really make the difference in your life uh, there are some courses which I've taken at both the law schools, which have really transformed my life. And like I cannot emphasize how much those professors really mean to me. Uh, like uh, you know, the, the the concept of office hours used to be a foreign concept until like I realized it in my five years at at the law school how crucial it can be into nurturing you as the kind of lawyer which you're going to become. So do talk to the people as to how accessible the faculty is. And I think that can be a that can be the deal breaker as well. If if it's accessible, go there. Oh, that that'll do wonders. And not only once you're in law school, but also when once you graduate, because you do need a kind of mentorship, and that is something that you uh, really did point out in the in the earlier answers, wherein you said that mentorship is so key. Uh, so I think uh, access to faculty and building those relationships are something that are uh, take you forward not only in law school but otherwise as well so that's a very interesting point you added to your discussion to this discussion so kushagra your closing remarks from today's uh, session uh, i think i i'm i'm really glad to be here it's it's great interacting with uh, young people it's very important to, i mean we were not able to directly interact but i think it's very important to get a perspective from students and the younger generation also i mean i'm not that old also but at the same time people who are, who are relatively younger to you and uh, we can always be yeah, relatively you're we uh, and everything is relative yeah. in this world <laughs> so uh, and and if, if if you guys have any any questions we are always very accessible uh, myself other other lawyers at sflc of course kabir uh, we are all there on uh, twitter as well so you can like 
follow what we do you can you can talk to us there we are all very approachable so if you had any questions that you weren't able to ask or were not listed in this discussion please feel free to like continue the debate and discussion uh, as well wow. i'd be happy to share your email addresses with the attendees because some of the questions were uh, left unanswered so kabir uh, your closing remark um, stay safe wear masks sanitize your hands eat well sleep well sometimes you forget covid 19 is, is not there but it is very much a third character in our lives and yes stay safe is very important and wearing masks is very important and social distancing is very important but at the same time being safe online is also very important oh yeah definitely so, so please keep these things in mind and i hope uh, this educative experience has uh brought in a lot of more awareness about the intermediary guidelines and what is happening over the internet thank you with that on that note we'll end the uh, session for today and it was lovely speaking to you thank you to the attendees for being so patient and for ever so kind uh, questions that you have posted for us thank you gushagar and kabir uh, to many more such discussions in the future because uh, this is an area which is uh, continuously evolving and all of us would like to pick your brains on the nitty gritties of technology law and how we interact with the internet thank you have a nice evening bye, bye. take care thank you bye